Okay, good, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the final uh, seminar for the Haas Faculty Visual Politics Seminar Program for semester one of 2019. Thank you all for being here today, again, as has been always a semester, I think, on a late on a Friday afternoon and up through what's been, I'm sure, a long semester. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Emma Hutchison, and I'm stepping in again for the group's director, Professor Roland Blacker. Today, I'm very delighted to introduce our speaker, who is a close colleague here in the School of Political Science and International Studies. Nicole George is an Associate Professor of Peace and Conflict Analysis. Nicole's work, like I think arguably all scholars uh, who speak um, and work across the VP program, is interdisciplinary and spans a range of social science and humanities fields. Her work focuses most closely on the gendered politics of conflict and violence, peace building and post-conflict transition, security and political participation. For almost two decades, Nicole has conducted research in the Pacific Islands region and in particular in Fiji, New Caledonia, Bougainville and the Solomon Islands. While her research deeply engages with deeply engages the cult deeply engages with the cultural context in which she works, the insights of her research illuminate the combined and broader significance of gender and cultural contexts at multiple levels of analysis, from the local to the national and the global. Today, Nicole, I think, is taking her work in a new direction, both in terms of analysing media imagery and the gendered politics of climate change. Just one final thing before I pass over to Nicole, and it's just a note on the format. Uh, as is typical, Nicole will speak for up to 30 minutes, and then we'll open up for Q&A and group discussion. If we could keep our questions as informal um, and our discussion as productive as possible for Nicole, that would be wonderful. So thank you. And with this, please join me in welcoming Associate Professor Nicole George. That's quite an introduction. Thank you, Emma. And I just have to say, I cannot believe how many people are in this room. So thank you so much, everyone, for giving up your time on a Friday afternoon at the end of semester. It's really nice to have such a lovely audience here. And it's really nice to talk to this group again. I've, I've um, spoken to them once before about research methods and my use of images in research methods. But this project um, that I'm talking about today is a little different to that and it's a reading of media and advocacy images um, on climate change in the Pacific Islands and an attempt to understand where, where and how gender is constructed in those images. I have to say, as someone who's worked on the Pacific, I've been really reluctant to get into the discussion around climate change and the politics around climate change. I think there's many more eminent people working in this area than I am, and I also think it's sort of a, quite a, a... I think it will become a very crowded field, so we have to really be at the top of our game when we're working on this stuff. There is someone who is really on top of the game here, Karen McNamara, so I'm a little nervous about pre presenting this paper in front of her too. But, um, but it is a pressing and urgent issue, so I also think you know, it kind of needs as many voices as possible. So it's sort of in that vein that I, I'm contributing to the debate. Um, and so what I'm doing, as I said, is looking at the gendered politics and visual images that are produced in the media and by activists about climate change in the region. And I want to show how women and men are different, often differently positioned in these debates in ways that I think reveal what I'm calling an architecture of entitlement. It's a term from political geography, but it's very political, I think. But people like, um, I first encountered it in the work of Neil Adger and Mike Kelly. Um, and I think this, thinking about the gender dimensions of the architecture of entitlement is really interesting for me. They don't really talk about gender, they talk about a range of entitlements, but I'm really interested in what this opens up for thinking about gender entitlement um, when communities are responding to this impending crisis that's occurring in this region. Uh, so for the next few minutes I'll take you through all of this. Um, as you'll see the portrait I paint is rather critical and I think it's not necessarily a happy one for women and I sometimes think to myself also am I drawing a bit of a long bow and exaggerating what the reality is. But I had a really interesting um, sort of moment when I posted on Twitter about this talk and I got lots of really enthusiastic responses from people, other scholars, but also people in the region 
Um, and one woman who I don't know, quite a few people contacted me that I don't know and sent images, but this woman, another, I just wanna show you this image. So this is an image of the Climate Action Pacific Partnership Conference, which took place in Fiji just a few, a couple of weeks ago. And it's uh, this, this woman, um, Katie Klimas is her Twitter name, sent me this, these images of Hilda Heine, who's the president of Marshall Islands, opening the conference. And these two women, who I, I don't know who they are, but they were obviously speakers who um, were involved in one of the sessions. And so I immediately tweeted back to her and, you know, messaged her back and I said, oh, you know, maybe this means I need to reorient my analysis. You know, women aren't sort of getting maybe as shut out as in the way I imagined. And she said, oh, no, I sent you this because this is in stark contrast to everything else that has happened at this event. So I thought, oh, that's revealing. But then soon after I got these images, um, these tweets were sent to me as well from Anna Powles, who's a... Uh, scholar at Massey University. And the first one is obviously uh, UN Secretary General um, Antonio Guterres, who was at this meeting or attended part of this meeting. And so, you know, as a, at a side event, he's stating, you know, the empowerment of women is one of the most important things in the world today for climate change, for peace, for so many issues. And then at the same time, pretty much this tweet was put out by Alpito Sio, who's an MP in New Zealand, and he's talking about, he's at this conference too, and he's talking about meeting leaders, Pacific leaders on climate change. Well, we can see very clearly here who the leaders on climate change are in the region. So I thought to myself, okay, it's all right. I'll keep on going because I, I do think what I've got to say is interesting. So let me say it rather than talk about saying it. So Pacific Islanders are often described as living on the front line of global climate change and their particular vulnerability to a global future of more um, frequent extreme weather events, sea level rise, ocean acidification and the salinization of arable land has seen them collectively likened to canaries in a coal mine. Mm. Their plight is depicted in recent films such as The Hungry Tide, Pacific Drowned, There Once Was an Island, all these all these sort of media productions um, contribute to what Elizabeth uh, Delury has called um, an ecological elegy of future mourning. Hence the trope of a fragile paradise doomed to extinction informs much of this work, which regularly features images of white sandy beaches, palm trees waving in a dappled sunlight, Islanders performing traditional dance and their children playfully running along the water's edge and aerial shots which emphasise the terrestrial, terrestrial insecurity of adult, adult dwelling peoples who seek to build their livelihood on strips of land wedged by a vast ocean that once nurturing is now also menacing. But where are the Pacific women in Pacific Islands women in these works and how are they able to speak? And so, as I said before, I think there's a gendered architecture but which really frames their contributions um, and rewards women when they conform to a trope of either gendered virtue or gendered vulnerability, but castigates them when they seek to challenge that trope. And so images like this one, which has been reproduced many times, I mean, it's a, all these images are really beautiful. Um, you know, I think they're really captivating images. Uh, and this one has been reproduced many times. It's by Justin McManus from Sydney Morning Herald. Um, and I, they reinforce this gendered vulnerability to the existential threat of climate change. So here we see the anonymous figure of a woman from Kiribati placed at the centre of a sweeping wide angle shot. And she stands precariously on this thin sliver of land with her back to the camera. So she's sort of anonymous. But her vulnerability is accentuated by the immensity of the surrounding sea and the expansive sky above, and her separation from that settlement across the water. Uh, tellingly, this figure is swathed in black, protecting herself from the sun, I think, but perhaps this black is a metaphor for future mourning as well. This trope of gendered vulnerability and virtue continues in a documentary photo project entitled Land is Life, which was shot in Kiribati and Tuvalu in 2014. 
In this series of short films, male narrators provide the overview and set the scene. Local male politicians and bureaucrats ruminate on the risks posed to their populations from behind large desks in front of banks of computer screens. Women's authority, when they have it, is differently constructed, frames in ter framed in terms which emphasise their dutiful caring and reproductive roles as nurturers of family and the environment. They're depicted both as vulnerable witnesses to the invading sea, which disrupts their work in cultivation and fishing, but also as virtuous in their efforts to test new cultivation methods, new fishing practices, or to be involved in coastal regeneration projects such as mangrove nurseries. Amongst the images which depict women at the heart of family and community life, we're encouraged also to reflect on their resilience and their capacity for adaptation in the face of environmental change. But these contrast with the ways in which men are represented. Women are the bearers of culture, responsible for the continuation of kinship and community. And their experience of climate change is bounded by these things. Sometimes this point is reinforced graphically when women are shot standing knee deep in water or standing and staring out at the watery horizon, often with some other symbol of their domesticity or nurturing, children, cooking pots, plants. Men are by contrast the bearers of political and technical authority on climate change and sea level rise and encouraged to make commentary on the responsibility of global leaders and policy failings for more of, and, po and the policy failings of more powerful regional powerful neighbours of more powerful regional neighbours who are accused of ignoring the insecurity that is being experienced on their doorstep those we are one of those more powerful neighbours if you're wondering Australia <laughs> So these images naturalise a gendered architecture of power, however. Men are the leaders. They have the political and technical acumen and a capacity to understand the regional and global dimensions of this challenge. The focus on women's resilience and adapti adaptability, on the other hand, seems to suggest a more passive politics of women, as well as women's incapacity to understand the challenge beyond how it impacts upon them in a day-to-day -day fashion. A contrast to this kind of politics is found in the campaigns of the Pacific or the campaign of the Pacific Climate Warriors that's been developed part of, as part of the Pacific 350 regional grouping, which is aligned with Global 350, a project that was uh, spearheaded by Bill McKibben since 2008. In contrast to the kind of imagery that I uh, described be, um, just before, this largely youth-led campaign, which operates across 15 countries, is very strongly activist, focused on building awareness in the region and increasing pressure on high emissions polluters and the, gov and the, go the governments who fail to regulate them on, um, on this issue. To support their claim, or to support their advocacy, the Pacific Climate Warriors um, argue that we are not drowning, we are fighting. So they're they're, they're not, it's not about accepting or adaptability necessarily to climate change as it's, as it's being experienced in the region, but a, a campaign to fight this. But they present themselves visually and rhetorically as engaged in a battle to, to defend their islands. Um, their advocacy materials incorporate visual images of young Pacific Islanders in powerful warrior poses, dressed in ways that reflect custom draped in tupper cloth or pandana skirts. Unlike the images described in the previous section, the women depicted in these campaigns are not diminished or dwarfed by the natural environment. Here too, the figures, the photograph figures appear knee deep in water or at the water's edge. But these representations allow the figures a centrality. They're not dwarfed by the ocean, they are the ocean's people a theme that resonates powerfully with Apeli Haofa's emblematic rendering of Pacific Islanders as united and drawing strength through expressions of an oceanic identity. The way gender roles are depicted challenges the earlier tropes I described here too. The Pacific Warrior campaign features many images of women and men together supporting each other in a fashion that suggests 
mutual strength. And as Karen and her co-author, um, Carol Faboko, I forgot her first name, note, this visualization of male and female collaboration challenges the long-standing patriarchal trope of the male warrior, which has had a powerful resonance in Pacific Island societies and history. Um, and also been drawn upon to legitimate male ascendancy in a range of other spheres of contemporary life as well. Um, so I'll just show you another one of these images. It is noteworthy that the Pacific Climate Warriors campaign includes representations of Pacific women who embody power in ways similar to men. Um, and so this poses, I guess, a provocative challenge to the architecture of entitlement depicted in the earlier set of photos that um, more generally stru structures some of this debate. So these images are very beautiful, but, also, but I also have some misgivings about them. And I can't help looking at them and thinking that they replicate the Orientalist gaze of early objectifying colonial portraits of Pacific Islands native populations, where, peop where local people performed their indigeneity for a metropolitan audience eager to learn more about the lives of the region's noble savages. So I include some example of these kinds of portraits here to give you a feel for what I mean. And I think as we look at these, it's important to consider, as Linda Tui Weiss Smith has, how these kinds of artifacts help to build a body of knowledge about Pacific peoples as the metropolitan sphere's other. And then how this homogenized cultural framing legitimated their subordination to outside authority on the grounds that they were lesser and needed to be civilised to Western norms. I'm going to come back to this idea of homog the homogenising frame in a minute. So with this in mind, I think it's important to ask how climate warrior, the Climate Warrior campaign constitutes its own performance of indigeneity and how that sits in dialogue with this earlier, these earlier colonial era images that contributed to the exoticization of Pacific Island peoples and, and their subordination too. Now it might be productively argued that the Climate Warriors campaign is reclaiming and subverting that tradition, particularly through its working, reworking of gendered roles, and I think it is. But I also want to show you these images which is a, these are by a contemporary visual artist called Shigeyuki Kihara. Does anybody, has anyone heard of this woman? So I know I've met Yuki, she's a fantastic artist, transgender woman. And uh, as I'm going to say, as I'm going to explain, I think her images should provoke us to think quite, quite, not critically, how can I put it, to question the Pacific, uh, the Pacific Climate Warriors campaign. So, this is a photographic triptych titled In the Fashion of a Woman. It was produced by Yuki in 2007. So Yuki is from a Samoan Japanese Fa Afafine um, and a contemporary visual artist. And she works a lot with sort of thinking about colonial legacies and how they shape, um, how they shape understandings of gender and understandings of Pacific Island peoples today. Uh, in this particular set of photographs, what she's doing is replicating the colonial photographic genre of representations of oceanic peoples, and particularly the trope of the dusky maiden. But there is something rather unexpected in the third photograph. So she's trying to show, I guess, that all Pacific peoples, even in one country, you can't, it's very difficult to homogenize a population. And she's doing, you know, this image is, or this set of images, is subverting the gendered binaries that colonial powers imposed on Pacific Island um, communities often, reminding the viewer unexpectedly of the place of transgender people within the, within the Pacific but also the ways that colonial and missionary influence has, construct, has constructed a homogeneity around indigenous identities, which has in the longer term diminished the standing and acceptance of transgender people in many Pacific Island societies. So to bring this back to the question that I'm posing about the Pacific Climate Warriors campaign, at one level we might say that their campaign expresses a similar visual challenge to colonial tropes described above. 
Nonetheless, the heavily stylized and staged performance of Pacific indigeneity in those photographs also seems to me to reappropriate those colonial tropes in ways that idealise and homogenise the region's cultures and its people. Um, and then I think these images might function as a benchmark to assess the authenticity of Pacific Islanders' claims for recognition in the global debate on climate change. Those who perhaps wish to be part of the debate but are unable to identify with these indigenised renderings of agency may find that the global impact of their message is compromised because they're unwilling to articulate their arguments in a way that are anchored by this trope of in cultural indigeneity. So I think this more critical lens is really um, comes alive uh, and is useful for examining the much celebrated address by Marshallese poet Kathy Jetnil Kishner, who spoke at the UN Climate Summit in New York in 2014. This was selected from five, uh, Kathy's address was selected um, from more than 500 civil society activists vying for the opportunity to address the uh, General Assembly. Jetnil Kishner's appearance was a source of great pride for, for the Pacific Island activist communities who really felt empowered, I think, but from my reading of what was sort of being published at the time, by what they viewed as global recognition of this situation. Her global audience inside the United Nations Nas um, General Assembly and beyond the walls of that building was captivated by the evocative words of her poem, Dear Mata Felipinum, mm. directed to her at the time seven-month-old daughter. A performance which made Jetnil Kishner's determination, which made clear, sorry, Jetnil Kishner's determination to ensure her Marshall Islands home would not drown and would always be there for her child. But like the Pacific Climate Warriors, climate warriors Jetnil Kishner's address was also a cultural performance for a global audience. She was carefully dressed in the traditional clothing of her place to remind her audience of her indigenous background. The framing of the address reminded her audience likewise that she was a mother. And so, like the women described in the first section of this presentation, it was her maternal and caring responsibilities and her gendered sense of virtue and duty to family, as well as her sinking islands, that seemed to lie at the heart of her activism. What I was struck by was that I really saw this as quite a shift in Jet Nokishna's from Jet Nokishna's previous work. She's someone that is actually quite well known in the Pacific region, even before this UN event. And I've been following her poetry for some time. Most of it is very powerful and angry. I contrast this UN performance with her poem, History Project, which protests the history of US nuclear testing on Marshall Islands since the um, early 1950s. Uh, another poem, Tell Them, if you search these on Google, you'll find them. Uh, another poem called Tell Them is a powerful commentary on climate change and conveys angry frustration and defiance over the predicament faced by the Marshall Islands. Notably, neither conforms to the gendered architecture which entitles Pacific women to speak or be heard politically. Neither references norms of maternal duty nor motherhood. While there are references made in Tell Them, to the cultural practices of basket weaving and jewelry production that are frequently done by women. The poem also allows us to understand Jetnil Kishna herself as someone who moves between the Pacific and the international, someone who travels, who has friends from elsewhere, who shares gifts from home with those not of that place. That is to say, her response to and understanding of climate change are not framed only by her identity as a Marshallese woman in contrast to the Landis life depictions, but as a Marshallese woman with knowledge and experience that has come from beyond her islands as well as from her place. It was therefore surprising to me to see the gendered architecture of entitlement shape so strongly this performance before the UN in 2014. Here she stood in Marshallese dress like the Pacific Warriors, performing her culture, and like the virtuous climate resilient women, performing her gender, talking to her child as part of the address. Indeed, as it was concluded, this, as the address was concluded, she was joined by her child and her husband at the podium, which you can see there, as if to reinforce the gendered rightfulness of her claim to be heard. Um, 
But I think there's some other really interesting things to, to sort of take away from this choreography of this event too. Because like the women in the Landis Life uh, documentary, Jetna Kishna in this setting appeared dwarfed by her surroundings and diminutive within the masculinized order of the UN General Assembly. Jetna Kishna, as the indigenous mother poet, was positioned to the right. I was trying to work out when I was writing this, is she on the right or the left? Because I'm never sure which way, like she's on the, anyway. We'll talk, that can be a question, is she on the right or the left? Anyway, you can see where she is. Uh, positioned to the right of an elevated central podium occupied, occupied by the United Nations hierarchy, um, which allowed the UN, then UN <coughs> General Secretary Ban Ki-moon and his male deputies to gaze down on the performance from on high. So the spatial configuration of this moment showed very clearly to me where, how the architecture of entitlement is shaped, where the hierarchy of power was located and where it was more marginal. I mean, Ban Ki-moon's surrounded by other men, in case you missed that. Uh, Jet Nukishna, a Pacific woman physically below and also to one side uh, of those for whom the power of the stage within the UN system accrues more naturally. Um, and I would argue that her capacity to enter this room required her to perform mm -hmm. in the way she did for that audience. And it, I think it was carefully chore choreographed in that way. So what, and I don't know her, so like, I would love to talk to her about that and if she actually had misgivings about that. But what do we take away from this? Because I think it's interesting and fun to look at images, but I think there's a deeper problem here. Um, if that's what it takes to get women like Jet, uh, Kathy Jet and Kishna into the room in front of world leaders, I fully celebrate that capacity and that ingenuity, and I think good on it because she beat 500 other people to get on that stage and, and she gave a really powerful and moving address. It's very hard to kind of watch that performance and not feel really moved by it. But there's a cost to all of this too. And so I'll leave you with a reflection on that as a way of concluding. Um, and I want to do that by talking about another response to climate change and I don't have images for this one. but. In the course of my work in Bougainville, I've also visited a resettlement project from the Carteret Islands, which some people may know about. It's, you know, people, um, it's become sort of one of the iconic case studies, I guess, if we can put it that way. Media seem to very much like this idea of this atoll island that is sinking, and the Carteret Islanders are often called the first climate um, change refugees, and that's a really problematic sort of framing, but it's, it, they're often referred to that way. And a group of Carteret Islanders have resettled on Bougainville. Um, but, you know, I think it's fair to say this resettlement project is not necessarily working as well as many hoped. It's led by a, a Carteret Islands woman that's very famous, Ursula Rakova. But when I visited there, I, you know, I didn't see it necessarily a terribly happy situation. I think the settlement is in a fairly precarious sort of condition. Um, and some political geographers have, have done more extensive research than I have, certainly. I've only just done a few interviews. But, um, you know, they've, talk, they've spoken about it as sort of verging on, on something, I don't think they use the term failed, but a troubled enterprise in resettlement. Um, and I would probably agree that people did not look happy here. Um, I think some have moved back to the Carterets and the sustainability of this overall enterprise looks very questionable. But what I'm always surprised on is no one has really commented on the huge hurdles that this project faces because it's being led, I think this is why, in part because it's being led by a woman who is trying to not only create physical security for this, this community but also economic viability. So she's trying to mount things like a cocoa trading cooperative. And one of the things she said to me, which you know, it didn't really strike me at the time until I started thinking about this with a lot of reflection. She said she's always accused of being a woman entering a man's world. And people say to her, why are you entering the man's world? Why do you want to enter the man's world of cocoa production? So she's, the, the gendered vulnerability of this situation is not commented on generally, but I think it deserves far more insight than it has had. 
But I think the significance of this as an obstacle only really becomes clear if we think about the broader optic of gender and climate change that has been generated in the Pacific region and the ways in which these gendered tropes of virtue and vulnerability operate as an architecture of entitlement, shaping women's access points into the debate and what they can do and say there. So just to close this off then, it's all very well and good for UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres to make his points about his support for women in leadership. I mean, I, I'm very pleased to see him make them because Ban Ki-moon never said anything about women. He was very unfriendly to the gender agenda generally. But, and I think we should be encouraged by them. But if we don't also challenge the gendered architecture of entitlement that is shaping this issue currently, then we're unlikely to see real transformation of the way that women can, can participate in the debate. They may be allowed certain inroads in, but the possibilities of innovation and transformation of this debate and creating opportunities for women's leadership, I think, are going to be really constrained. So, you know, it's nice and fun to talk about images, but I also think there's actually a really critical deeper politics that is revealed through all of this too. So thank you. <laughs>